Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. And for today's video, Jack is here with me because we have a Stellar Crown set review to get through. Some pretty interesting and impactful cards, lots of Terrastal support coming out in the set. That's one of the big themes here. And the set is out on the 13th of September and will be legal for the first time for the Dortmund Regional Championships. So let's get into it. And as always, you know the drill now. You've got the Omnipoke rating system and the community ratings. Thank you so much to everyone who... Voted on their star ratings for these cards. As always, it's interesting to see how we compare to the community. Uh, but without further ado, let's jump into the A specs. And the first is Sparkling Crystal. This is a Pokemon tool card. And the attack cost of the Terra Pokemon this card is attached to is reduced by one of any type of energy. So uh, already we're jumping into the uh, Terra support. Very, very powerful tool. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of expect this sort of effect on an A spec. Uh, it's very, very versatile. It being a tool means we already have plenty of ways of searching for this. Arvin is a staple in multiple different decks right now. Choruses has seen a couple of playing a couple of decks. You can add in Town Store and maybe search out an energy as well with Choruses Tenacity and essentially get two uh, energy attachments for your turn, combining the energy and the crystal. So yeah, you you're able to ramp up uh, your energy attachments quite quickly. And um, some of these awkward new Terrastal Pokemon have very annoying attack costs. Um, and you know you can actually sort of weave your way around some of these. We already have Dragapult EX which has seen some play so far, but never really taken off of its own deck. It's been a little bit underwhelming. We actually think this card could push it into its own deck and be a pretty viable archetype, not just be one of the bit part players of the Reggie Drago V-Star deck. Um, the biggest thing about that deck was struggling to get a Phantom Dive turn two because you needed to find awkward energy. Uh, and we think that it's actually a lot more possible with this in combination with another card as well uh, from the new set. So Phantom Dive is still a very scary attack to be using on turn two, and I think Dragapult is probably the best user of a Sparkling Crystal. Again, a deck that already uses Arvin and such. But there's also the new Galvantula EX. Uh, one, being able to use it for the charge web attack, so that's only a one energy attack cost is really nice, but two, also being able to use a full Gearite attack for uh, some slightly less awkward energy costs. Obviously, that normally uh, requires three different types of energy, but this at least helps you weave, weave in uh, the first one and is an item-locking attack, so that's really nice to be able to then slow the opponent down and hopefully start chaining these attacks. Uh, you can also use it with some of these Ogre Ponds. The Wellspring Mask is definitely the one that comes to mind because you're able to use Sob and Torrential Pump. Much nicer energy costs. Being able to use Tor Torrential Pump for Double Turbo is actually very, very appealing, especially on the first turn of the game. Um, that's quite a lot of pressure at times so yeah very very powerful tool one that i expect to see definitely in dragapult maybe in a couple of other decks but uh, yeah could push that archetype up to the top tiers finally the other a spec tool card we get is deluxe bomb not quite as impressive this one if the pokemon this card is attached to is in the active spot and takes damage from an opponent's attack put 12 counters on the attacking pokemon and if you put any damage counters on in this way you discard the bomb so possibly there could be some single prize style decks that utilize this sort of effect just to increase your damage output effectively or again, something like an Ogre Pond deck that has naturally low damage cap. Uh, if there are some like awkward Pokemon that answer you, uh, you could have a bomb attached to your Ogre Pond so that as soon as they start attacking into this, you're like revenge KOing it essentially from your tool effect. And yes, it's Arvin Searchable, which is a nice upside. We think there's probably going to be just far better A specs at your disposal. Those are really the only applications that we could think of, which means it's probably not going to be as good as some of the other options we have out there right now. Next up, we have the Great Tree Stadium car. This is a Stadium A spec, so these usually have pretty powerful effects, and this one is no different. Uh, it lets you essentially search your deck for a Stage 1 Pokemon to evolve from one of your basics, and then if you do, you can then search for Stage 2 to evolve from that Stage 1, uh, provided that basic Pokemon has already been in, t in play for a turn. And so it's essentially cheating out some evolutions, which uh, on the first instance, I think seems like a very powerful effect. But one of the difficult parts about this is it's quite difficult to find. Obviously, we have things like Chorus's Tenacity. Maybe you can Pidgeot the uh, use your quick search with Pidgeot to search it out. But realistically, there's not reliable ways of being able to uh, have this on the turn you need it. Realistically, it's on that turn two. You really want it on that turn two to cheat in a stage two into play. But if you're having to get Pidgeot into play in the first place, you're kind of already jumping through some hoops anyway. Um, again, you could play a load of Chorus's Tenacity and maybe you build a deck around that with some other stadiums and such. But it's a lot of work just for your a spec to be used on essentially just cheating out some evolutions it's a little bit harder to sell when we already have a reliable rare candy package in the format there's also a handful of stage twos that actually like uh, to be put into play from the hand thinking charizard ex mainly we actually did test this with charizard and pidgeot and it was largely underwhelming partly because you needed to get your stage twos out before there was any real benefit from the great tree but also partly because you wanted to play charizard from hand to have access to the infernal rain ability so there's still some minor synergies here and there um, it's a very powerful 
uh, stadium. I could maybe see it seeing play eventually, but uh, even in the best stage two deck in the format right now, we didn't find it too impressive. So that's why we've held it back at this two star. Break Tree could be used as a counter to some of these item lock strategies. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the Galvantula and Bennett had a little bit of surprise sort of play at Worlds. Great Tree gets around these decks that try and lock out your candies and stuff. They The stage two decks don't typically play a lot of stage one Pokemon. So uh, you can use Great Tree to cheat your way out of those, which is a nice sort of, I, I guess, additional benefit of playing that. But again, these uh, item locking decks haven't been particularly impressive. There was some uh, splash success at Worlds. Uh, we haven't really seen much else from that. And similarly, Galvantula hasn't overly impressed us in our early testing. So I don't think there's enough of a benefit for these stage two decks to also have a counter for the item lock as well. Moving on to the regular items then, and we have Glass Trumpet kicking things off. Another card that interacts with Terra Pokemon, as you can only play the Glass Trumpet if you have a Terra Pokemon in play. You get to choose up to two of your benched colourless Pokemon and attach a basic energy card from your discard pile to each of them. Now, there aren't a huge array of great colourless attackers, but Terrapagos EX is a new card from this set, which can benefit from a card like this, with its unified beatdown attack, which is for two colourless, so you can just play a bunch of basic energy and have Trumpet as your acceleration onto multiple Terrapagos, ideally, because it does also have a nice coloured attack for Grass, Water, and Lightning. You do 180, and you can prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from basic non-colourless Pokemon. Bit of a mouthful, but there are lots of archetypes that are just basic attacks, Attackers right now, and Terrapagos using that second attack, thanks to Glass Trumpet trying to weave these energies all together, uh, could actually be an annoying, like, walling Pokemon. Also, we could think about something like Blissey EX becoming part of a package deal, where we have the four Glass Trumpets attaching to Blissies, and then use the Happy Switch ability to move those energies all over the board onto other types of Pokemon, which could be interesting. Or just, as we've seen, heavy item packages with Pokestop, you could have Trumpets and E-Switches. You know, it's eight cards in your deck, which is quite substantial, but it could be a way that you could weave in other attackers as well. There's also the opportunity for some Pokemon which don't really care where those energies are flying onto. If Raging Bolt is using, like, Squawker Billies and some other colourless Pokemon in the deck as well, I've experimented with uh, Noctowl, which we'll talk about about later, really promising stage one from the set. Chempow, as we know, has often had Bibarel in the deck list, uh, and Galvantula can be partnered with that Blissey, which we have seen a little bit here and there. These Pokemon don't care where the energies are scattered onto, well, certainly the Bolt and the Chempow, because the Hailblade and Bellowing Thunder can discard from anywhere. So simply having the Glass Trumpet, even in lower counts in these decks, like one or two counts, really adds to your burst damage output potential when you are coming up against some of these tankier stage two Pokemon or up against some big hit point buff tools. So going to be a card that you have to build very specifically towards this effect, but it is a very powerful means of accelerating from an item. Next up we have the Gravity Gemstone, a Pokemon tool card that says if the Pokemon this card is attached to is in the active spot, the retreat cost of both active Pokemon is one colorless more. So this is kind of one of these disruption tools. We've seen a handful of these see play in some control decks in the past, and I think this could definitely fit into those. It could be a really annoying tool to stack onto your Mimikyu or one of your, you know, basically any of these really annoying Pokemon that you like to leave in the active and try and cause a problem for your opponent. Um, I think it definitely fits into those kind of decks as a one-off. Pidgeot Control can easily chew to this out at the right time and just sort of start to cause some issues in combination with things like Iono and stuff. Similarly, uh, there's been some Japanese results with this seeing play in Dragapult. That first Dragapult often uses the Sparkling Crystal, but the second one in combination with like Countercatcher and Iono can maybe try and trap something in the active with Gravity Gemstone. Iono them down to a low card hand, card hand and then Phantom Dive across a couple of turns to take multiple prizes and close out the game. And similarly, again, it's another annoying piece to add to the puzzle of item lock that these Bennett and other item locking decks could play. So yeah, a very, very impactful tool. I think this is definitely going to slot in as a one-off here and there. I don't think it's going to be in everything, but I think it could see some serious impact in some of these decks that can tutor out at the right, right time and sort of maybe buy themselves an extra turn. These item locking archetypes, these spread archetypes, all of those kinds of things really like just buying themselves turns and getting more damage on the board and trying to slow down the game so that they eventually win themselves the game. So yeah, I can definitely see it slotting in as a one-off in a lot of these types of decks. Onto the supporters then, and we kick things off with Briar, a card with bags of potential and is certainly terrifying. It's going to warp how we have to navigate lots of prize maps because you can only play the Briar if your opponent has exactly two prize cards remaining. But it states, until the end of this turn, 
if your opponent's active Pokemon is knocked out by damage from one of your Terra Pokemon's attacks, take one additional prize cards. So essentially you're turning every Terra Pokemon into Iron Hands with that amp view very much. But of course, lots of these Terra Pokemon can deal substantially more damage than an Iron Hands ever could. There's Counter Catcher in format as well, so there are going to be situations where your opponent goes down to two, then you have the vicious combo of Counter Catcher plus Briar to take a knockout on a two prize Pokemon on the opponent's bench, four three prizes to actually close out a game. There's lots of combos you can make happen with this approach, and Terrastal Pokemon have been all over the metagame as of late. There's also, of course, the Cursed Blast abilities from Dusclops and Dustawar, which can effectively force the opponent down a certain prize map. If they're on odd prizes, you can use a Cursed Blast to put them back on to even and two remaining, so that then you could take advantage of a Briar. There are situations where you could even, you know, take a four prize turn effectively with Dustawar carrying a single prize, then Briar carrying a two prize four three prizes which is absolutely crazy the community can also see the potential of this card certainly and i think that's because there are so many terrors in the format right now there's terrapagos there's charizard there's raging bolt which has of course ogapon in those high counts even if ogapon is only going to be taking three prizes up against charizard that can swing a matchup because raging bolt previously was terrified of taking a single prize ko on some of these like evolving decks certainly against charizard that was one of the harder matchups for raging bolt now you can bellowing thunder to take a single prize knowing that later on in the game you'll have a briar turn where you can briar and use teal mask ogapon to ko a charizard for three which is pretty terrifying to be honest with you Charizard and Terrapagos, these are going to have engines that can cherry pick this card for the right moments, either with Luminion, with Pidgeot, or possibly with Noctowl as well. One of the coolest things about Noctowl is that it gets the Briar and the Counter Catcher that I mentioned previously. So this has a lot of combo potential with archetypes we already know are in the meta game. It's going to be one of these strange cards. Me and Jack actually have been underwhelmed by this card in testing, but that's really the nature of this card, where there's going to be certainly many games where it's unusable, just based on how your opponent's taking their prize cards. There are a number of archetypes right now which set up multiple KOs, whether it's Reggie Drago or Dragapult, these sorts of things. So it's not always going to be online for you, but it's going to open up so many more avenues of play, and your opponent will just be terrified of going down to two prizes up against some of these Terra decks. So simply making your opponent take strange lines um, can actually give you win percentage even when you're not playing the card itself. So it can be forced by you sometimes if you're building in a certain way with those Dust Noirs and such, and it's going to make the opponent play differently, and it already just slots in. Most likely just going to be a maximum one copy because you can only ever play this on one turn of the game, really. But it can cause some chaos and will swing the game in the later stages. Next up we have Crispin, a really interesting supporter card that says search your deck for two basic energy cards of different types, reveal them, put one into your hand and attach the other to one of your Pokemon. So it's a way of accelerating an energy, but it's a really nice way of being able to, again, get around some of these awkward attack costs of the likes of Dragapult and Galvantula, whilst also getting an extra energy attachment as well. Um, it's it's a, re a really fantastic card. I actually love this card. I think it's a really creative way of being able to uh, play decks with multiple different energy types, but also um, accelerate to them. I think, again, this in combination with the Sparkling Crystal is what's going to push Dragapult to actually being able to consistently Phantom Dive on turn two. Uh, you don't always need an attachment turn one anymore. There's multiple ways that you can still Phantom Dive, even if you miss that attachment turn one. And typically the Dragapult decks played a very low energy count. So having Crispin, having Crystal just makes that so much more reliable. It's a really, really nice way of being able to still get into the game quite quickly. Similarly with Galvantula and some of the other terrors that we will talk about later on today, the stellar ones as uh, they're called, uh, they have awkward energy costs, so being able to hopefully not have to worry too much about finding the right one at the right time and actually having some tutor plus additional attachment for them is really nice. I think this could even see play as a potential one-of in a couple of other decks that aren't terror based um, Rage Drago has in the past played Gardenia. I feel like this is pretty much just an upgrade. You can super rod in the late game to get your energy attachments back and be able to search out a grass plus attach the fires that you're always trying to dig for on your uh, Reggie Drago. And again, you can kind of use this as an extra e-switch or whatever. It's an extra attachment that you get per turn to be able to try and close out the game. And similarly, Raging Bolt, I don't think it's necessarily going to see play uh, in that too much because I think Noctowl solves a lot of the issues of missing Sada. But you could see this as potentially like a, a fifth Sada in some cases where you're able to attach a load of energy to your bench through Teal Mask, um, but then also be able to just attach the or search out the correct energy for Raging Bolt itself to be able to use Bellowing Thunder. So there's a lot of utility for this. I think it's only certainly going to be in Dragapult, but I think there's a lot of use for it in a lot of other decks. And I think it's uh, got a good life ahead of it because I think basically any dragon type that comes out any terror 
uh, Stellar Terra EX that comes out, all of them are definitely going to look towards this as a potential way of accelerating energy um, and not having to worry too much about finding energy on the first turn, just worrying about getting your board set up, knowing that Crispin can sort of fill the gaps later on. On to Kofu then. This is a supporter card which has a couple of Pokemon sort of tied to it with their ready-to-cook abilities. So they cost one less colorless energy for each Kofu in your discard pile. So there could already be a reason to play four Kofu in your deck uh, just by wanting to get them in the discard pile for these wacky Pokemon attacks, which we'll get onto in a moment. First of all, the ability of the supporter itself puts two cards from your hand to the bottom of your deck in any order, and then you draw four cards. If you can't put two cards from the, your hand to the bottom of your deck in this way, you can't play the cards. So it's not that great, to be honest with you. It's a bit of cycle. You know, seeing four additional cards is okay. Um, it's not going to really help get them in the discard pile either you're going to have to have a lot of discard synergy to make this work and you need a lot of tutor for supporter cards which isn't the easiest thing to do either so i think the ready to cook package that we get from the set is kind of waiting for an a spec which we know is coming uh, in a future set so maybe we can try out this gimmick in future so maybe one for the binder but for now it's not going to do too much next up we have lacy which says shuffle your hand into your deck then draw four cards if your opponent has three or fewer prize cards remaining, you draw until you have eight instead. This is one of these coming from behind supporters that we've seen, similar to Cynthia's Ambition and stuff like that. These supporters aren't really seeing too much play now that we have things like Iona and Roxanne in the format, but it's worth noting that this is another one of those. I think Iona and Roxanne still massively outclass this because a lot of the time you're looking for disruption rather than raw draw especially in the later stages of the game at least with Cynthia's ambition you could use it early on and get a lot of hand advantage but by the time your opponent's down to three prizes you just want to be trying to disrupt them out of winning the game which is where Iono and Roxanne come into their own so yeah just another one of these kind of coming from behind supporters but I don't think it's going to be one that really takes over the Iono or Roxanne slots in decks. And we come on to stadiums and the big one is area zero under depths. This card breaks the rules because now, if you have a Terra Pokemon in play, you can go all the way up to eight bench Pokemon rather than the traditional five. It's a spiritual reprint of Skyfield, but does have a few extra hoops to jump through and that we have to have Terrastal Pokemon in play already. And whenever this stadium leaves the field, or if you no longer have a Terra in play, you have to reduce your bench down to the more traditional five, and that's before promoting as well. So definitely got to keep on top of that whenever you're playing this card yourself or up against this card. Make sure that you're on top of things in terms of board states. But this unlocks so much potential. As we know, the Terrapagos does more damage based on your own bench. It can go up to 240 damage output with that unified beatdown if you fill it up entirely. And Palkia V-Star, even things like Raikou V, N TV, these sorts of attackers which deal damage for both yours and your opponent's bench now you're at least getting that sort of plus 60 damage in on your own end and forcing those KOs making it much more difficult for the opponent to play around one hit KOs in the first instance these sorts of attackers get a huge buff and will undoubtedly start looking at the area zero under depths there are just so many archetypes that can take advantage of this sort of stadium it's not that much to ask for many archetypes to just incorporate some terrors Miraidon can tutor out a Mewtwo via tandem units uh, there's also the Ogre Pond already in Raging Bolt and just gaining more spaces for your bench in that regard to have more Teal Dances, just have more Mew, Squawkabilly, Pheasantipity, all these incredible basic ability style Pokemon on your board is phenomenal. There's even wacky combos that we could unlock like Reggie Gigas coming back. If you have a Terror in play, you can have the six Reggies and then something else to attach to. You don't have to attach to the Reggies themselves. We could have an Iron Hands powered up in a turn thanks to Ancient Wisdom. So there could be some wacky toolbox style approaches thanks to the stadium as well. And again, just thinking about other decks in the metagame, we've already mentioned it a couple of times in the video, but Terrors are already, you know, dominating the game in all sorts of archetypes. So there are going to be situations where even things like Charizard and Dragobolt can just bench up, you know, six, seven slots on their board and possibly even Stadium Bounce after the fact. And that's going to be a means of, similar to Collapse Stadium, removing things like Rotom and Luminion and the other prizes that your opponent has scattered around the board to make it more difficult for them. So I think it's a really interesting one, both for archetypes that can use the Stadium and ones which aren't playing the Stadium themselves, but can take advantage of certain situations, either for pseudo-healing effects with Stadium Bumps or just going wider and 
having more license to have more of these ability style Pokemon in your deck, knowing that you can cash in on them later, uh, even with, you know, quite tight bench space traditionally in an archetype. So very powerful stadium card. I think it's going to be in a whole host of archetypes, not just going to be for the bench damage output lovers, but also going to be because there are so many great abilities to use right now, just having more space for those sorts of effects is going to be crazy. And we're also going to get onto the colorless package later on. And I think specifically Fan Rotom having more space to work with is going to be really important for those sorts of strategies. So the Area Zero is once again going to be a really crucial card and really brings back the Stadium War because as of late, it's only really been Pokestop that's been seen in high counts and archetypes. Whereas now there's much more reason to have Stadium Bounce in the deck, but also playing four copies of this card just to go wide as quickly as possible is going to be integral for some archetypes. And finally, we do have some bulk trainers. There's a couple of new fossils that have unique effects, but the Tortuga and the Lilip and their respective lines aren't particularly impressive. And similarly, we have a couple of tools, the Okaberry and Piapa Berry reduce damage from certain types by 60. But again, these uh, these types of tools typically never do particularly well because they're very focused on trying to counter one specific archetype. And there's very it's very rarely a format where this kind of tool actually has a massive effect. Uh, and then you have to have it on the right turn and all this kind of stuff. So these four are pretty... Uh, uh, pretty obviously bulk, but they are featuring in the set as well. And here's our trainer rating summary, so feel free to pause here if you want to take a look at where we've rated everything before we jump into the EXs. We start off with the stage 2 Hydrapple EXN, 330 hit point grass type. It has the ripe charge ability. Once during your turn, you can attach a basic grass energy from your hand to one of your Pokemon. If you do, heal 30 from that Pokemon. Grass energy is really good right now because of the Teal Dance ability on Ogapon, one of the most playable basics that we have in the game right now. So just having more ways to cheat more energy into play is not really a bad thing. We already have sort of the direction that we want to go down if we're going to build towards this Hydrapple, especially when you look at the Syrup Storm attack for two colorless, you do 30 plus 30 more for each grass energy attached to your Pokemon. So the idea, of course, is you're going to have lots of teal dances going on in the opening stages. Then you work towards that sort of rare candy combination, possibly, and you can get this Hydrapple, which which is much tankier than a Teal Mask Ogapon and is benefiting from all of those other Pokemon on the bench. Even though Ogapon is so good, it's normally good because it helps ramp the basic stuff or even Reggie Drago on turn two. And these decks are just gonna be faster than the Hydrapple. You also only have 40 hit points on the Aplins, which is a real disappointment for a card like this, which otherwise might see some play because there are so many archetypes which punish low hit point Pokemon and especially 40 hit points is just ridiculous that you may never even get your Hydrapple out into play. I guess the sort of in air quotes upside of this card is that you're quite tanky but even then like looking at the other stage two archetypes charizard and dragapult they'll have radiant charizard that hits the hydrapple for weakness so that's not even going to be the case and as we know the racing two prizes will oftentimes find a way of dealing with the teal mask ogapon on some one of the games so unlike these other evolving stage two style decks that are successful in the format they often represent a single prize that your opponent has to take on turn one of the games to sort of buy them still those three turns to come back Whereas that's not really going to be the case of Hydrapple because you're always feeding them those two prizes in one way or the other because you just have to get Teal Dance going. Otherwise, Syrup Storm is doing basically nothing, which is a real shame. Hydrapple does have the interesting evolution line of Diplin with that do the wave attack. So maybe there's a world where you have like a thick line of the stage ones and then just Hydrapple in like a one count or something like that to try and be this weird hit point offset style Pokemon. But it's not going to really do that much damage if you haven't, built entirely around Syrup Storm, so there's not much hope for this card, I don't think, but it might be worth experimenting with just because Grass is so strong right now. On to Cinder ACX, and this is the first of our stellar Terra Pokemon, so sort of the gimmick behind these is they're all Terra Pokemon, but they all have an attack which has a really unique attack cost. You can see here the Garnet Volley has a Fire, Fighting, and Darkness in the attack cost, so that's kind of the unique effect of all of these Pokemon. And the idea is you use cards like Crispin and Sparkling Crystal to get around the awkward attack costs. Typically, these attacks are very powerful. So, uh, yeah, they're always definitely interesting to at least take a look at. The Cinderace is a really cool one. Um, it has 320 HP and it's Flare Strike attack, which isn't actually its 
kind of unique attack. It's just its regular attack is uh, pretty strong for three energy. You do 280 damage and you can't use Flare Strike during the following turn. We actually have a few ways of being able to accelerate towards this attack. We have Sparkling Crystal, as already mentioned, as well as Crispin. But we also have Magma Basin and there's even Double Turbo as well, which will reduce your damage a little bit, but can at least get there quite quickly. Um, you know, Crystal plus Double Turbo means that you're actually only one attachment away and you're only doing 260, but that's still pretty, uh, pretty like respectable in the early turns of the game. And then Garnet Volley does 180 Snipe for that awkward energy cost. I think you're rarely going to be building around this one just because uh, 180 Snipe does knock out a few things, but typically you want to have an attack that's able to deal with uh, more HP, things like other Pidgeots and all that kind of stuff. I think the most unique selling point about this deck is the fact that the Cinderace has free retreat. That means you could build like a Featherball style deck where you've got Pidgeots and Cinderace. I think that's probably the selling point, but I don't think that's enough of a selling point um, in combination with Flare Strike, which again is an impressive attack, but there's nothing really that stands out compared to some of the other stage twos we have. It gets onto the board a little bit faster than uh, Dragapult and Charizard, sure, but I feel like the upside of those two uh, is a little bit more beneficial than the Cinderace overall. So yeah, just going to be a one star but definitely an interesting featherball style deck could be made there if you wanted to try and go down that route. We come on to another stellar EX Pokemon. It's going to be Galvantula, 260 hit point lightning type. That charge web, very efficient rate, to be honest with you. Hitting into an EX or V, you deal 220 for one lightning, one colorless. Pretty decent. It's not getting over a lot of the like attacking ones, but lots of the bench sitting EXs and Vs you can tackle quite nicely. And of course, we're hitting for weakness. That lightning type coverage will be useful for Pidgeot EX and possibly even Palkia V-Star if that makes a bit of a resurgence thanks to Area Zero and some of the other synergistic cards in this set. So that's at least a little bit relevant. And then the Fulgurite, the awkward attack cost, deals 180 damage for Grass, Lightning, and Fighting. And you discard all energy from the Galvanch but during your opponent's next turn they can't play any item cards from their hand. It is possible to try and chain the, the Fulgurite attack. That's kind of one of the best things of item lockers if you can continue that lock for a number of turns. In order to make that happen, you probably will have to have Sparkling Crystal as your A spec and have, you know, a handful of Crispin in the deck to try and use this over a number of turns. Or you could have the Glass Trumpet Blissey combo or, you know, Trumpet with other colorless Pokemon and have a number of E-switches in the deck. That's a lot to ask for to make multiple Fulgurite happen, but I think if you just do it once or twice, you should gain like enough tempo in a number of matchups, definitely into the stage twos, right? That's the best time item lock is going to be strong, denying the rare candies, denying the ultra balls and that sort of thing. That's where you'd get a lot of value out of just two turns of item lock, really. But I think it's still a bit of a challenge to make that happen on, for example, turn two, then into turn three. It does seem like a bit of a high roll. There is the Joltik, though. It has the battery charge attack for one colorless. You get to search your deck for two basic grass energy and two basic lightning energy and attach them to your Pokemon in any way that you like. So if you go second with a Galvantula deck, you could start off with a battery charge and maybe that sets up the first couple Galvantula in theory. Uh, as long as you've got, you know, the triple Joltic down and got that energy attachment, it's a bit to ask for, but it could come together, which then sort of sets up the next couple Fulgurites. I think that's one of the most interesting things. One of the most awkward things though, is that having three Joltic in play, three 30 hit point Pokemon can get punished by a few archetypes in the format, of course. You can't really make that play happen if you're seeing a uh, Dragapult archetype or a Regidrago archetype, which is really, really scary. So it's going to be difficult to maintain these Galvantula and in mid-game, you're going to have these weird situations where you don't really want to bench Joltik into a number of matchups, which is kind of the main hindrance here, just how small the Joltik actually are. Uh, we have explored an Area Zero Regigigas combo as well. It's quite a lot to ask for to get the Gigas maintained the entire game, let alone weaving in a Stage 1 Pokemon as well. But it again demonstrates like how we get the Fulgurite up and running and chain that attack. And to be fair, the Ancient Wisdom would be probably the easiest way to chain a Fulgurite throughout an entire game if that was going to be something we were after. But it's a strange one because Galvantula is efficient with its first attack and not too much work to build into. But like, it's only middling damage output and the Fulgurite is almost too much work. And unfortunately the Joltic does hold you back a little bit, even though its attack is very strong. It's going to have limitations as you get towards the mid and late game into some matchups. Next up we have the Dax Bunny X, which has the full meal time or time to chow down ability as it's translated in English. Which says, once during your turn, when you play this from your hand to evolve one of your Pokemon, you may heal all damage from each of your evolution Pokemon. And then you discard all energy attached to each of those Pokemon that were healed. So this could be a really interesting combination in maybe like a Pidgeot control deck or a deck like Blissey X where you're able to move your energy around whilst being quite tanky and then uh, heal and then move your energy back on with Happy Switch and stuff like that. 
think overall it's not a particularly impressive one, but it's one worth noting because these healing effects every now and again can be quite impactful. And when you have some of these tanky evolution Pokemon, particularly Blissey with that 300 HP, it could be an interesting 1-1 one -one tech line for a deck like that. Now, Blissey hasn't been particularly impactful ever since it's been released, but one to keep in the binder just in case it does be become popular at any point. And we've already spoken about this card indirectly a couple of times, but just to go over the Terrapagos EX in greater detail, it's a 230 hit point colorless Terra EX Pokemon. That unified beatdown attack for two colorless does 30x the amount of your bench Pokemon. You can't use this attack during your first turn going second, however. Even though the unified beatdown is a one energy attachment and this is an EX basic, you would think that sort of leads it down the direction of being an aggressive style archetype, as we've seen many other iterations as of late. But that text on unified beatdown means it's not really going to be one of these two prize racing decks that we've come to know it's going to have a different direction entirely and that might include some tanking which we'll get onto in a moment and a few other options however that 240 threshold is still very relevant for dealing one hit KOs into opposing EXs and other engine Pokemon on the bench which is always fantastic and it's a solid chunk to put into obviously V-Star and bigger EXs in the format. The Crown Opal attack for Grass Water Lightning does 180 and during your opponent's next turn prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from basic non-colorless Pokemon. There's a lot of them in the format right now. There's the Raging Bolts, there's Maridons, there's Ancient Boxes, these sorts of archetypes could all in theory become good matchups for Terrapagos if we can assemble the Crown Opal attack thanks to the Sparkling Crystal perhaps, thanks to Crispin the supporter and thanks to the Glass Trumpet, all cards from this expansion. So they are trying to push us down the direction of the second attack with Terrapagos as well in some instances. We've been exploring both both double turbo energy builds purely with Terrapagos and just looking at the unified beatdown as well as some trumpet base lists which do incorporate all of those different energy cards and tries to get them going on Terrapagos to give yourself a better time into, into some of those basic matchups. Terrapagos has so much support in this set. It really does seem like the flagship archetype, if any, is going to come from Terrapagos here. We have that Briar supporter, which means that Terrapagos could take three prize cards as you get to the later stages of the game, which is dangerous. The Area Zero pushes the unified beatdown into that one hit hero range, which I think is really important. And we have a lot of great colorless Pokemon. Fan Rotom can help us fill the bench, which is going to be important for the unified beatdown attack, uh, and is just great for getting support Pokemon online. And the Noctowl can allow us to search for two trainer cards and that really allows the Terrapagos to piece together the combos that it needs because it will be needing quite a lot really to sustain that unified beatdown throughout the entire game and maybe helps cherry pick things like the Briar in the later stages of the game as well so it's not something you always spam on turn two of the game there will be situations where you have to but it can be a great thing to hold off on for a late game swing turn. One of the cool things of a double turbo energy build is that it could synergize nicely with some hit point buffing tools and Penny, because there's also a Boofalant in this set, which buffs basic colors Pokemon as well. It's kind of meant to go alongside the Terrapagos. You need two of them in play, so it again leads into the high bench size that we have of Terrapagos. So if you incorporate additional hit point buffing tools, that Penny is going to be a really strong target for you to just buy a free turn back. Similar to how we've seen things like Arceus and Teleon in the past, or things like Zoroark with Ace of Roller in the past, I feel like Terrapagos sort of sits in that realm where it definitely could be built in that direction. And finally, there's a handful of noteworthy bulky Xs. There's also a load of very bulky Xs that we haven't featured today, but there are a couple that are worth at least just mentioning. The Lapras GX has a powerful splash attack that does more energy, more damage for the amount of energy on it, and the Laramar Rain lets you look at the top 20 and attach as many energy cards that you find there to your Pokemon anyway. That's a very impressive attack, but takes a lot of setting up. The Medicham EX has the Chi Atsu attack, which puts the opponent down to 50 HP. Again, some of these attacks are sometimes relevant, but putting them onto 50 is quite a lot. You still need a lot of combos to then try and get an in-between turns knockout, so not too impressive there. And finally, the Orthworm EX has the Kapow Return ability that deals damage back to the attacker based on the amount of metal energy attached to Orthworm. You can actually scale this very high with things like Metang and uh, stuff like that to be able to deal a lot of damage back. But again, Rock Tomb isn't a particularly impressive attack. There's not really any benefit other than some cool highlight reel moments where maybe you'll take your, a, a knockout and your opponent won't with the amount of metal energy on you. It's not really particularly competitive, but it could be a fun TCG live moment, if nothing else. 
And here is the EX ratings if you want to pause, but we're moving on to the non rule box Pokemon. And we start with a little Mo Rotom, a 90 hit point grass type basic. Has the Reaping Dash attack for one colorless energy. You deal 30, but before doing damage, you discard all tools and special energy from your opponent's active Pokemon. And this can be a pretty cheeky tool for some controlling style archetypes. We know as of late, Lugia has been a real problem for things like Block Snorlax. They've had to go quite high on Temple of Sinnoh and Giacomo and such. Uh, but the Mo Rotom could be another means of you just getting rid of lots of energy in one go. The issue is, of course, Mist Energy is one of the special energy the Lugia players themselves have, so you probably still have to have Temple of Sinnoh in the deck list. But if you are playing like a mini attacking package, maybe a Pidgeot Control again that naturally plays energy in its deck, could have a Mo Rotom as a means of just removing, you know, like three or four energy all in one go. It's a bit less versatile than the old Yveltal that we used to have from Celebrations, but I still think it could be quite relevant if we need to have an answer like this, and if Lugia remains one of the top contenders in the format. Onto the Joltik that we have already had a brief chat about. The battery charge letting you attach up to four energy essentially is very powerful. And if you're not pairing it with the Galvantula, you could maybe pair it with Iron Leaves EX or even Iron Hands EX. These could be other options. I still don't think this card is going to see much play outside of just the Galvantula deck, which I don't think we'll see massive play anyway. But it is potentially worth trying out as a maybe an energy acceleration option in the early turns for some of these other uh, Pokemon other than Galvantula. Next up, we have the Stage 1 Noctowl with the Dual Seeker ability. When you play this Pokemon from your hand to evolve your Pokemon, as long as you have a Terra Pokemon in play, you can search your deck for two trainer cards, reveal them, and put them into your hand. This is a really, really powerful effect that can allow you to build your deck entirely differently. Now you can have some one-of cards that you can guarantee for the right moments, or you can have an array of supporter cards, like in ones and two counts, knowing that you can use the right one in the right situation, rather than having to, you know, maximize copies, just hoping you have highest odds of finding that on turn two. You can build your deck in a different way, similar to the old Inteleon engines, knowing that with this Noctowl at your disposal, you can find those cards for the critical moment. And how many times have we said it throughout the video, Terra Pokemon are already very good, and this just gives you another incentive in certain archetypes to take advantage of these Terra Pokemon. There's already some great combos we can think about. It might be one of the reasons why Palkia V-Star is creeping back into the metagame. We know the solid foundation of Palkia's decent damage output alongside Radiant Greninja. Now Palkia gets higher damage output and the Greninja becomes much more reliable on turn two of the game with that Jewel Seeker allowing you to cherry pick the Prime Catcher and the Cancelling Cologne to make a Radiant Greninja combination happen against these evolving archetypes, which sounds really, really dangerous. And failing that, the Noctowl is already just getting you things like Irida and whatever else you need just to get into the game as well. Even just helpful for Palkia having a Prime Catcher on a two prize Pokemon on the bench and initiating that race. That's going to be really useful. It's a great card also in the Terrapago style decks. If you are building around the Glass Trumpet, it can cherry pick things like Vessel and Trumpet in one combination to get that energy acceleration rolling. It could be useful for the double turbo energy list to cherry pick those crucial supporter cards, whether it's going to be Penny, whether it's going to be like Briar counts catcher as a combination, the Noctowl can make that happen and just help out on turn two of the game, getting more engine Pokemon and just more basic Pokemon in play for the Unified Beatdown to deal more damage. Getting those area zeros out the deck as well can be pretty integral. And it doesn't really stop there. There's just so much versatility to this card. You could also think about this in a colorless control style archetype, mostly because of how good Fan Rotom is, which we'll come on to in a moment. But the Noctowl can help you get a Pidgeot. And then when Pidgeot's online, that's still one of the most busted engines in the game. And already the Pidgeot control decks look to have Terra Pokemon in their deck. So leaning more heavily towards Cornerstone Ogapon seems reasonable just to have the upside of this Noctowl as well. And the Raging Bolt, it's not in all the Raging Bolts that I'm seeing out in Japan right now. In fact, it's commonly not within the 60, but I'm a big fan of the Area Zero uh, Raging Bolt. It's been testing quite well for us over the last few weeks, to be honest with you. Just having the guarantees of certain cards, you know, getting that Prime Catcher exactly when you need it, getting those Sardas and making sure you have the next one for the following turn. Yeah, it seems to have nice synergy here. It can also allow the Trumpet to make its way into Raging Bolt for even more burst potential. The Noctowl just allows you to build differently, is super versatile, and forcing a Terra into play isn't really a downside. In fact, most decks will already have reason to have Terras in play already. So I think there's just a lot of ways you can build around this Noctowl, which is going to make it very versatile and powerful. And the perfect partner for Noctowl is the Fan Rotom, which helps get it into play. The Fan Call ability can only be used on the first turn, but and you can only use one Fan Call per game, but it lets you search for three colorless Pokemon with 100 or less HP and put them into your hand. 
Uh, that's very key for searching out hoot hoots, but also searching out noctowls. So you can find a couple of hoot hoots and even find a noctowl for the next turn and hopefully be able to then uh, jewel seek your way into the game. Uh, you can also find Buffalance, another card that we'll talk about momentarily. So being able to find this new package from Stellar Crown is also uh, is just going to be really, really powerful. But there are plenty of colorless support Pokemon already in the format that are very impressive. We've already talked about it in Pidgeot Control, but there's plenty of decks that run Pidgeot. You can even play like... Uh, Pidgeot plus Fan Rotom combo to be able to find a couple of Pidgeys in the early turns. Or we've even seen decks in the past play Pidgeot and Bibarel, so you can use your Fan Rotom to find Bibarel at, or Bidoof and Pidgey at the same time and then sort of start building your board that way. If you want to just go down the Bibarel route, you can even find Squova as well. So this Fan Rotom doesn't actually seem like it's just a one stop partner for the Hoot Hoot Noctowl combo. It can find all sorts of colorless support Pokemon, and I think we're going to see it in a lot of different decks. I don't think it's necessarily always going to be the best way to play it, but the versatility of being able to find the Noctowl engine, the Pidgeot engine, the Bidoof engine is just going to be really powerful. I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation with this and it will be interesting to see whether there are any lists that end up adopting this as their way of searching out uh, their support Pokemon rather than just using ball search cards instead. The other key part about Fan Rotom is its attack Assault Landing, which is actually really impressive as well. For one energy, you deal 70 damage provided there is a stadium in play. Now, typically with a lot of these decks, they actually want to have Area Zero in play. So that's uh, no downside. You're going to be looking to play this with Area Zero decks anyway. So that's really powerful. But still, plenty of decks play lots of different stadiums and your opponent can even put stadiums in play for you as well. So being able to do one for 70 is very impressive, especially in some of the decks uh, that typically like to just go 2-2-2 two, two, two and play a load of two prizes. Think your Raging Bolts and stuff like that. Maybe you can play the Fan Rotom and Noctowl package and also be able to poke something with a one prize and maybe set up uh, one less energy or something for your following turn whilst also leaving a one prizer in the active and stopping your opponent from using uh, from using the fact that you're just playing two prizes to their advantage and try and race you uh, in these decks or in, in these types of decks that we've seen uh, sort of rise to popularity whilst Reggie Drago has been so good things like the Raging Bolt the Maridon even the new uh, DT Terrapagos deck all of these are very much going to be racing decks trying to take two prizes turn after turn after turn and it's often decided with these kinds of decks who gets the first two prizes? Well, if you're able to leave a fan Rotom in the active, not only are you stopping your opponent doing that, but you may even be setting up an easier knockout for yourself on the following turn as well. So yeah, really, really nice one. Uh, nice ability, but also a nice attack. Very good, very, very versatile. And I can't wait to see how many different decks try and adopt the fan call and assault landing into their decks. The final Pokemon we have to talk about is that Bufalant. It has the curly wall ability. As long as you have at least one other Bufalant in play, all of your basic colors Pokemon take 60 less damage from attacks from your opponent's Pokemon and this is a non-stackable effect so it's only going to work if there's two Bufalon down which is pretty handy. Bufalon has 100 hit points so it is in range of a fan call from Rotom which is pretty handy and it seems to be quite obviously strong alongside Terrapagos EX pushing you up to that 290 hit points. That's 10 more than the sort of general threshold a lot of archetypes are reaching towards with that 280 oftentimes being a critical number. As we know, things like Reggie Drago often will copy a Giratina, which hits that 280 threshold. So pushing a little bit further out of that range is going to be quite handy. And again, sort of leans towards a tankier approach of Terrapagos if you do go down a double turbo energy route with things like Hit Point Buff and Penny in the mix as well. It's actually really difficult to deal with the Terrapagos. It's almost like the bulk of a Stage 2 EX, even though it's just a basic Pokemon. And it's really unlocked in this archetype because you have the bench space to have two Bufalon in play just for the purposes of bulking out. This can also allow your like lower hit points colorless Pokemon like Hoot Hoot almost have a pseudo Manaphy in play thanks to the Curly Wall. Now you sit out of range of something like a Radiant Greninja on turn two. So the deck doesn't necessarily have to have Manaphy in the list. You could just go down a Curly Wall approach instead and have upside with your Terrapagos also being bulked out. And that's it for the very notable non-rule boxes. There are a few less than we would usually talk about today because we're going to do a hidden gems video looking at some of the other non-rule box Pokemon that we haven't talked about today. So make sure you stay tuned to the channel for that. But these are the ones that we really think are likely to make an impact into the format, especially the four and five stars. Uh, one of these weird sets where maybe some of the non-rule boxes are actually much better than the rule box Pokemon we see. So yeah, very, very cool set, very impactful and uh, looking forward to seeing how these cards adapt to the meta, particularly the Noctowl and the Fanro. Tom. So that's it. That's our set review. It's been pretty interesting to take a look at the Japanese City League data right now. They've had Stellar Miracle for a couple of months and still we haven't seen the full potential of Terrapagos. We haven't seen the Noctowl engine really 
establish itself in any one archetype, but it really does feel like they're so versatile and the Area Zero opens up so many avenues that there's still going to be lots of combos to be unearthed. Just in this last week, I've thought of all sorts of different ways to build Terrapagos. It's a card that I'm really honing in on because I think there's so much untapped potential right now. There's also a lot of threat and presence from the Palkia archetype, and that Briar just changes the way the game's played as well. So I'm personally really enjoying exploring the format, and there's going to be lots of that coming onto the channel over the next few weeks and months. There's still some uh, tabletop testing videos coming out this week. Uh, we've got a buy list to come, and then we're going straight into PTCG Live. I'm going to have even more gameplay as well, uh, preparing for the Dortmund Regional Championships. So, hope you enjoyed the sort of shorter approach for just the most impactful cards coming out from the set, because we're also going to be getting creative with lots of the cards from this expansion as well. So, if one of your favorites wasn't mentioned, uh, be sure to stick around for another video where we're going to deeper dive into some of the more fringe cards from the set with some combos you may not expect. So, keep an eye out on the channel, and we'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers.